This is the kind of pass that you had to carry. It had your fingerprints on it and your photo and who you worked for and where you lived and where you were allowed to go and when you were allowed to go there and for how long and for what purpose. Starting in 1950, with the Population Registration Act, everybody in South Africa had to register with the government by race. A racial review board, essentially, would, would give you a look, decide what race they would say that you were, and they would give you a racial ID card so you would know which laws applied to you and what you were allowed to do. But as of 1952, every black person in the country over the age of 16 had to have not just a racial ID card like everyone else, but also this passbook, which any white person could demand to see at any time. And if you were found to be in a place that was not just reserved for black people, if your passbook did not explain that you had explicit permission to be there as a non-white person, then it was illegal for you to be there and you could be arrested just for existing. Just not having your passbook on you at all times was also grounds to be arrested and thrown in jail. The pass laws meant that by virtue of being black in South Africa, you were presumed to be a criminal unless you could prove otherwise by having the proper paperwork. And any white person could challenge you anywhere for any reason. And if you did not have the passbook, if you did not have the right documents, if you didn't have the right written permission to be where you were when you were there, then you could be put in jail. Passbook laws had been around on and off in South Africa since the 18th century. And this, the structure was always the same. White people never needed them. White people could go wherever they wanted. But non-white people needed essentially a permission slip, an internal passport. Papers, please. Passbook laws of various kinds were not new. But at the end of World War II, the election in South Africa in 1948 unexpectedly brought to power a nationalist government that had run explicitly on a platform that they called apartness. The word apartness in their language was pronounced apartheid. And so when the so-called National Party came to power in 1948, they started codifying immediately all the various ways that they could separate the population by race and treat people according to the ways that they thought the various races should be treated. In 1949, the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, which banned people of different races from getting married to each other. Whether or not you got married, the Immorality Act of 1950 made sexual relations between people of different races a criminal act. Also in 1950, the Population Registration Act, which made everybody in the country register by race and receive an official racial classification, black, white, Indian or colored, those were the four categories, and then there were a million subcategories beneath those. Uh, I should say, not beneath white, of course. White was just white. But for everybody else, it could be a little complicated, depending on what your review board thought of you. Also in 1950, the Group Areas Act, which geographically partitioned the country along racial lines. That one formed the basis for the state forcibly relocating people within the country by race. In 1953, the Reservation of Separate Amenities Act. So that's 1953, that's the year before the US Supreme Court declared that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. The year before we said separate but equal was dead, South Africa codified it explicitly for their nation. The apartness, the apartheid system of separate schools, separate hospitals, separate beaches, separate buses, separate park benches, separate everything. Everything assigned to specific races. And the lion's share of everything, and of course the best of everything, reserved only for the white minority. Black people had no right to vote. People classified as colored, uh, for a while they had a right to vote specifically for white people to represent them, but eventually that was stripped too. Only the white minority had the vote in the end. Only the white minority was represented in government and only the white minority had any say whatsoever in the affairs of the nation. 80% of the country lived entirely segregated and without representation under white rule. 80% of the country. And by 1960, the resistance to apartheid, the demonstrations against it, had started to zero in on those passbooks, those pass laws, the papers please laws, which made your mere existence criminal if you were challenged by a white person as to what you were doing there. 
In 1960, when different resistance movements were competing with each other about tactics and about strategy, about the best way to try to overthrow apartheid, just outside Johannesburg, in a black township called Sharpville, somewhere between 5,000 and 7,000 people turned up at the local police station in Sharpville and said they wanted to turn themselves in. These thousands of people, they turned up and they said they all felt that they needed to be arrested. They all wanted to be arrested, all 5,000 of them, because they said they did not have their passbooks, and so they were turning themselves in for arrest. That act of protest was greeted by the local police with live ammunition. They shot into the crowd. They wounded over 150 people, including many women and children. In the end, the police massacre at Sharpville killed 69 people. At the time, Nelson Mandela was in his early 40s. He had joined the African National Congress, the ANC, way back in 1944. The ANC and the other major organizations opposing apartheid in South Africa had been organized as nonviolent movements, nonviolent resistance and nonviolent organizing. But after Sharpeville, they decided that maybe that wasn't enough. After Sharpeville, the ANC decided that it would form a paramilitary wing. And Nelson Mandela was one of the ANC leaders who went underground to help start it. They said that they would target government buildings and strategic infrastructure, and they would try to sabotage the state. After Sharpeville, the government of South Africa started mass arrests of ANC leaders and other activists. They banned the ANC. They made it illegal to be a member of that group. Nelson Mandela was arrested for treason in 1961, but he was acquitted. He was arrested again in 1962, and this time convicted, convicted of traveling illegally. They sentenced him to five years hard labor on South Africa's version of Alcatraz, which of course is Robben Island. While he was already serving that sentence, while he was already in prison, they put him on trial again, this time for sabotage. And they convicted him, and they sentenced him to life in prison, to life on Robben Island. And so in 1964, he began a new sentence that was a life sentence. And for the first 18 years of it, his cell on Robben Island had no bed, no plumbing of any kind. He was permitted one letter every six months. He was permitted one visitor per year for 30 minutes. He became a symbol worldwide of the fight to stop apartheid. The South African government would not allow a picture to be taken of him in prison for decades. And so the image, the free Nelson Mandela image, was always him as a young man in his 40s, as he had been when he had been locked away, even as he aged decade after decade in prison. He served 27 years in prison, 18 of them at hard labor in that island cell before South Africa was finally ready to give up apartness, to give up apartheid. And when F.W. de Klerk was elected president of South Africa in 1989, it was essentially to relent, to finally at least start to give up the arcane and brutal racial system that South Africa invented. It's hard to remember, but really invented after World War II, after Hitler and that they fought for for 50 years against the people that they subjugated with that system. F.W. de Klerk was elected in 1989. He then legalized the ANC. He unbanned the organization. And in February of 1990, he visited then 71-year-old Nelson Mandela, still imprisoned 27 years later, and he told him that he was going to set him free the next morning. And on February 11, 1990, Nelson Mandela emerged. I now present to you the great leader who has been in jail for 25, 27 years. Amanda in Africa. Nelson Mandela speaks after 27 years. And fellow South Africans, I greet you all in the name of peace, democracy, and freedom for all. I stand here before you not as a prophet, but as a humble servant of you, the people. 
After 27 years in prison, when Nelson Mandela was released, he led the negotiations for the ANC for the end of apartheid. And apartheid was dismantled. And on the 27th of April in 1994, Nelson Mandela was elected the new president of South Africa in the first election ever held in that country where all adult citizens were welcome to vote regardless of race. Millions of people waited in line to vote in voting that took three days. And April 27th is now a national holiday in South Africa. It's called Freedom Day. And when it came time to sign the new constitution for South Africa, which eliminated all vestiges of law by race, President Nelson Mandela went to Sharpeville to sign the Constitution. Today, at the age of 95, Nelson Mandela died at home in South Africa, at his home in Johannesburg. His family says it was his wish to be buried in the town where he was born. Joining us now is Congressman John Lewis, Democrat of Georgia and civil rights leader. Congressman Lewis, thank you for being with us here tonight in this historic day. Well, thank you very much, Rachel, for having me. And thank you for that rich history, telling the story, what happened and how it happened. It is very moving. I have to ask, after your long career, especially as a, as a young man uh, in the South and the American Civil Rights Movement, how did Nelson Mandela's work inform your own? What has he meant to you over the years? How, what, what's been the interplay between our civil rights movement and his struggle? Well, the leadership the vision, the commitment, the dedication, the inspiration of this one man meant everything to the American Civil Rights Movement. I remember as a young student in Nashville in 1962 and 63 and 64, we said, if Nelson Mandela can do it, we can do it. We identified with the struggle. And when I met him for the first time, he said to me, John Lewis, I know all about you. I follow you. You inspired us. I said, no, Mr. Mandela, you inspired us. So that was this unbelievable relationship between what was happening in America and what would happen in South Africa. Uh, we would say from time to time, the struggle in Birmingham, the struggle in Selma is inseparable from the struggle in Sharpeville. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today, Congressman, was reading about and thinking about and trying to understand the importance of those decisions that were made by Mandela and other ANC leaders and other anti-apartheid leaders after Sharpeville when they decided that nonviolence wasn't enough. They had been committed to nonviolence in the way that you have been so overtly committed to nonviolence throughout your life, throughout those struggles, even in the face of incredible physical brutality. And they decided when they saw those people massacred that they needed some sort of military response as well. It never ended up being the key part of their response to apartheid, but they made that hard decision. How, how international were those discussions about the importance of nonviolence and whether or not it was enough to overthrow governments and to change the world? Here in America and around the world, there was ongoing discussion about the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence, appealing to people to not to give up, but Mr. Mandela and the people of South Africa learned. And staying in prison 27 years, he came out committed to the way of peace, to the way of love, to the way of nonviolence, to the way of reconciliation. In South Africa, through his leadership, he liberated the spirit of the oppressed and the spirit of the oppressor. When you met him, uh, when, when he was released from prison, you described a little bit about what that conversation was like. Was it, is, what, what, what did it feel like for you to meet him? Is that an intimidating prospect? Was it an inspiring prospect? What was that relationship like? It, 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 it was both inspiring and intimidating. We, we greeted each other. He gave me this unbelievable hug. I hugged him. He helped me tightly. And I, and I said, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mandela. Thank you. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you for being such a leader. I knew I was standing in the midst of greatness. So I was a little nervous about meeting him. And I had an opportunity to see him several other occasions. And he just made me feel more human. 
Congressman John Lewis, uh, you, I, you are the person I wanted to talk to more than anybody else tonight. Thank you so much for being with us, sir. I really, I really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got so much more ahead. Please stay with us. Lots to come. I went to see the man who organized this stairway, a 42-year-old African lawyer, Nelson Mandela, the most dynamic leader in South Africa today. The police were hunting for him at the time, but African nationalists had arranged for me to meet him at his hideout. He is still underground. This is Mandela's first television interview. I asked him what it was that the African really wanted. The Africans require, want the franchise on the basis of one man, one vote. They want political independence. Do you see Africans being able to develop in this country without the European being pushed out? We have made it very clear in our policy that uh, South Africa is a country, country of many races. There is room for all the various races in this country. You see, I wasn't born into a political family. I was not active in student government in high school. But when I was in college, there was one issue that moved me for the very first time in my life to become politically active and play a small leadership role in my community. The issue was apartheid. And as a young college student, I became involved in the divestment movement in the United States. I remember meeting with a group of ANC leaders and hearing stories of their struggles and of their leader, Nelson Mandela. That was a video birthday message that President Obama prepared for Nelson Mandela back in 2008. We've got much more ahead. Please stay with us.